At least six Palestinians have been killed and dozens injured in Israel's hours-long attack on the Janine refugee camp on Monday. This follows near-daily raids by Israeli forces across the occupied West Bank. So what's behind this rise in violence? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohammed Jamjoum. There's been an escalation by the Israeli army in the occupied West Bank, which has not been seen in decades. Israel's far-right government has increased its raids against Palestinians, launching military operations that often result in deaths and injuries. On Monday, the air was filled with the sounds of whirring blades from combat helicopters, live ammunition and stun grenades. Israeli forces had launched an attack against the Janine refugee camp that would last for hours. The city of Janine has become symbolic of the Palestinian resistance, and in recent years, several armed groups have emerged. Israel says it's going after these groups that pose a threat to its security. But Palestinians say they're the ones paying a high price. We'll get to our guests in a moment, but first, this report from Nida Ibrahim. There's a sense of pride amongst Palestinians. They say the fact that fighters in the Janine refugee camp who have limited weapons, limited training, if any, managed to incur damages to the Israeli forces, injure Israeli soldiers. Palestinians here say that they're disillusioned by the international community and by the possibility of having a peaceful resolution to their case. We've been speaking to fighters in the Janine refugee camp over the past year or so and they were telling us that they don't believe that the Palestinian Authority is doing anything to protect them and they say that the real violence that's happening in the occupied West Bank is the decades-long Israeli military occupation. It's manifested in so many different things, in the ongoing killings, the almost nightly and daily raids, but also in the illegal Israeli settlements that are expanding and expanding. They're all illegal under international law. We have United Nations Security Council resolutions condemning those settlements, saying that they need to be dismantled. But still, they're still expanding, taking up land. And not only that, the resources of Palestinians, they have their own infrastructures. So for Palestinians, they say they have to fight the ongoing Israeli occupation. Now, when it comes to how this year is looking, we're talking about 134 Palestinians who were killed by Israeli forces this year alone in the occupied West Bank, and we're still in June. 2022 was considered the deadliest year in the occupied West Bank with 170 Palestinians killed by Israeli forces. So that could give you an idea. We're still in June, and who knows how the year might end. For Inside Story, Nida Ibrahim, Al Jazeera. Let's take a look at some of the Palestinian armed groups operating in the occupied West Bank. During Monday's assault in Janine, fighters from the Islamic Jihad faction and Fatah al-Aqsa brigades fought back. The factions have been operating under an umbrella group called the Janine Brigades, which emerged in 2021. In the old city of Nablus, the Lion's Den group has been involved in armed confrontations with Israeli forces since August 2022. And now... There are many more resistance groups, including Tul Karam Brigades and Aqabat Jabr in Jericho. All right, let's go ahead and bring in our guests in Tel Aviv, Yossi Beilin, a former Israeli Minister of Justice and Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs. Yossi was the former Israeli negotiator during the 1993 Oslo Peace Accords. In Ramallah, Noor Ode. She's a political analyst and columnist. Noor is the former spokesperson for the Palestinian Authority. And in London, we have Bill Law, editor of Arab Digest and a former BBC Gulf and Middle East journalist. A warm welcome to you all. And thanks so much for joining us today on Inside Story. Noor, let me start with you today. Uh, what happened on Monday in Janine, this marked a sharp escalation in fighting. What's behind this rise in violence? Well, I think what's behind it is the overall context. You have a right-wing uh, government in Israel that is intent on um, uh, uh, stealing as much Palestinian land as possible. That's the government program. It's not a secret. It has employed all tools of oppression and violence against the Palestinians. And as your reporter uh, uh, on the ground Nida, pointed out, the number of Palestinians killed this year so far, uh, you know, uh, looks very grim if you compare it to last year. It, it does look like this year is going to be even 
deadlier. So all of those things combined, the measures that the Israeli government has taken to expedite uh, colonial expansion, to deny Palestinians more and more rights, and the, the fact that Palestinians don't see anything moving, if you will, on the road to their freedom, uh, makes uh, for a very fertile ground for opposition and resistance and increased resistance to the occupation. You'll see uh, these were the fiercest clashes in years. Uh, the fact that this fight lasted 10 hours and that the Israeli army faced such tough resistance from Palestinian fighters, what does that signify to you? Nothing is new. We have uh, had this, uh, these conversations for years and years. I think that the world is not there for us, is not interested anymore in our conflict. Uh, there are other conflicts in the world, and, and maybe they are more important. And if we, those among us on both sides who believe in peace and who believe that these clashes are idiotic, totally idiotic, just young people are dead and wounded for what? What, are, what is the, the target? We have to see together. At least the, the, the informally, if the government of today in Israel is not interested in peace, I think that what, what we have to do, those who believe in peace on both sides, is to sit together and to think about ideas and to go to the world and say, help us in, in, in implementing them, in, in putting them on the agenda. Don't forget us. We are paying the price. Uh, Bill, uh, Israeli forces have been raiding Janine and Nablus for more than a year now. Why are there so many raids happening by the Israeli army into the occupied West Bank at this particular time? Well, I think that the violence is escalating uh, to an extremely dangerous level. I think the reasons are quite clear uh, for the escalation, particularly uh, since the carbon together of the most extremist government in Israel's history that brought in people who, uh, well, Mr. Smotrich has described himself as a fascist and a homophobe. Uh, it's my uh, Ben Gavir, a man who clearly hates Palestinians. Uh, these people have an agenda which is based on the violent removal of the Palestinian people. And Mr. Netanyahu, in accepting them into his coalition, has accepted that agenda. And I think this is why we're seeing this severe escalation and some extraordinarily, I think, dangerous developments that, unless, as Yossi Berlin says, uh, the world asks people to think again, then we are really moving into some very, very serious uh, and frightening uh, territory. Nor the fact that these raids keep happening regularly in Janine and in Nablus, how, how damaging is that to the Palestinian Authority? How much does that impact their credibility amongst Palestinians? Well, I'm, I'm not sure how much credibility the PA has left uh, uh, to spare, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, this is a very weakened uh, uh, political system, weakened by division, weakened by lack of accountability by a one-man rule, by refusing to go to elections and refusing to uh, work on ending the internal division. Uh, it is broke. It cannot pay its civil servants. It hasn't been able to do so for uh, about two years now. Um, uh, the civil servants receive uh, maximum 80 percent of their salary every month, and they live hand to mouth. So you know, more raids, more statements of of, of uh, full Israeli control and um, uh, total disregard to the shambles that is the the that are the accords that were signed once upon a lifetime between Israelis and Palestinians. You know, it it goes without saying. I think that Palestinians uh, see what is happening, understand that the PA is unable to protect them and help them, and are further frustrated by the fact that the PA is uh, appeasing uh, regional and international pressure to engage in silly, meaningless talks uh, like those uh, that happened in, in Aqaba and in, in uh, Sharm el-Sheikh, to talk about, you know, pretty much nothing, to receive empty promises that are not um, respected by Israel, and to, again, have an international community that is all but dormant. 
when it comes to Palestine that does not want to uh, 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 not only engage, it doesn't want to even tell Israel what it needs to hear, which is that it is mm -hmm. acting like a pariah state, uh, and, and um, ending this conflict. And Noor, just to follow up with you on, on another train of thought, uh, the fact that these armed groups exist, how much is that a response to a leadership vacuum at the national level? Look, Palestinians have been resisting for decades. This is not something that results from a, a lack of anything. The fact that the, the political system and that political factions overall are failing their people only increases the need, the popular need to feel that there is something, uh, somebody out there, a group of young men that can uh, at the very least do their best to uh, uh, protect their neighborhoods and towns. And, and we know that the balance of power is completely skewed towards uh, Israel. Uh, everybody understands that, uh, even in Janine and Nablus. But it is um, you know, the journey of a people who have been oppressed and occupied by a foreign power for 75 years. Uh, they want to break free of that bond, uh, whether the political factions want it or can deliver it or not. So they, that resistance, if you will, will continue with or without the political factions. Having a political horizon, having movement by way of you know, uh, stopping the settlements, retreating from those uh, uh, settlements, ending the pariah status of 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 uh, of Israel ending its impunity and its status above the law would give people some hope, but in the absence of that, and mm -hmm. in the presence of double talk from the international community, mm -hmm. who are uh, going beyond every measure and means to protect the Ukrainian people's right to uh, defend themselves against occupation and to resist the occupation mm -hmm. with all military means available, it's very difficult to convince Palestinians that uh, taking up arms or, or, or rising in protest or even civil disobedience is something that they shouldn't be engaging in. Uh, Yossi, what we've heard thus far from the panel in the conversation is that the situation is dire, is dangerous, seems to be growing worse. You heard Noor there talk about the fact that there doesn't seem to be much willpower, if any willpower, on the part of the international community to try to make things better. I want to ask you, from your vantage point, are there concrete steps that could actually be taken by any international actor at this point to de-escalate the situation? Yeah, I, I'm sure that there are steps like this. And uh, one of the main points is that the world should come to us, should visit us on a high level, meet with the Palestinian leadership, meet with the Israeli leadership, actually tell them what is expected from them, from the point of view of the world, if there is something like that. In the past, it did happen, and it did cause things like the, the Madrid conference and, and, and other developments which were positive and uh, were destroyed by extremists on, on both sides. You have on the Palestinian side a weak leadership led by a person who, is, who believes in peace, but far from being able to implement implement something like that. You have the split between Hamas and Fatah, uh, which makes it more difficult to get to political uh, decisions. And uh, we spoke about Israel. I mean, we have the most rightist government ever uh, on our side. If the world is not there, especially the United States, but also Europe and the Arab world, then it will, I, I, I cannot see how can we move unless really, and maybe it is imaginary, uh, peace, peace lovers on both sides meet and talk informally and suggest ideas like we did in the past with the Geneva Initiative and lately with the idea of a confederation between the two, uh, two uh, independent states, uh, Palestine and, and Israel. But it is not enough. We need a support, support, we need the backing of the world. And the world is not, is not there, including regretfully also the Arab world. Uh, Yossi, let me also ask you, uh, from the perspective of the Israeli government right now, how much of a security threat does the Israeli government consider this new generation of armed groups to be? 
This is not a strategic threat. It is a tactical th threat. It is it is annoying. It is it is problematic. Uh, people are killed, but it, it is not a strategic uh, threat on uh, on Israel, uh, and and that is that is why I, I believe that. Uh, those who are now in power in, in on our side, and some of them are really messianic. They believe that they, they are uh, doing things because God is behind them. I, I don't believe that uh, for them the question is is the uh, whether it is a small threat or a bigger threat. They they believe that they are doing the right thing with with the, the last the, the uh, problematic uh, the resolution. Of, mm -hmm. of 4,500 uh, housing units, they believe that they are solving the, the problem. They, are, they believe that they are doing what they should do. And it is very difficult to, con to convince them, not mm. only that it is against the international uh, law, which is the case, uh, but also that it is a kind of a boomerang to Israel itself. If you don't want to have a, a solution, what do you want to have eventually? that mm. there will be no border between us and our neighbors, and, and Israel will be a, a Jewish state with a Jewish minority dominating a, a Palestinian majority. This is your, your dream. Mm. This is what you want to... It is a disaster for us. Uh, Bill, uh, you heard Yossi there uh, talk about uh, the United States, talk about Arab countries, talk about other players within the international community um, who perhaps could be doing more to play a role in trying to de-escalate the situation. What do you think? Is there a political willpower right now for more members of the international community to step in and really try and look at all this on the granular level and come up with some kind of a political solution? Yeah, well, it's interesting, Mohammed. You, you, you mentioned a number of countries. Uh, the one country you did not mention was the United Kingdom, which I think has a signally important uh, role in, in the whole conflict and how it has devolved. Uh, Britain basically walked away from Palestine, uh, abandoned uh, its, its, its position, stated position. The Balfour Declaration was supposed to be a declaration that would ensure the rights of both Jews and Arabs. The Brit Britain walked away from that. Britain today, could it be doing more? Should it be doing more? Of course it should, as, as should other countries, as should Europe. I think that we often expect too much of the United States. We know the United States' influence is waning diplomatically in the Middle East. We know that Arab leaders regard Mr. Biden as a weak president. But there are opportunities here, I think, for Europe and the United Kingdom to step up. Will they do it? I fear the answer has to be, again, and sadly, no. And what that does is it empowers this extremist minority that has really taken control of the Israeli government. It empowers them because our silence, our hesitancy, our regretful messages of concern do nothing but encourage these people who have no intention of trying to work towards a peaceful solution. Mm. When you look at people like Smotrich or Ben Gavir, they want violence. They want escalation. They want the justification to carry out what they see as their perhaps righteous duty, their religious obligation, whatever, their messianic impulses. We, yeah. by our silence, empower that. Bill, let me also ask you about uh, the UN's role in all this, because uh, we've heard from the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, he's urging the Israeli government to stop its decision to speed up the construction of illegal settlements in the occupied West Bank. But do those words carry any actual weight right now? Um, I, I mean, are they falling on deaf ears, essentially? Well, I think they are. I think uh, Israel, for, for again, for decades, has been deeply suspicious of the United Nations, uh, in most cases, I think completely wrongly, perhaps in some cases uh, with, with some degree of, uh, of uh, validity. Um, yes, it, it is falling on deaf ears. And I, and I do think that, you know, Israel is running out of, of solutions, if you will. Its only solution seems to be violence. Violence begets violence. This is a path, a dead end path in the end, because the Palestinians will stay, they will fight. They are enormously courageous and determined, 
and and they're young men will fight we are seeing that now we will continue to see that unless and until there is an acceptance that the road that israel is now on is mm -hmm. the wrong road and it's israel who has to make that decision to get off that road Noor, let me ask you about these words we heard from Mr. Guterres. The Secretary General said that uh, Israel's decision to speed up the construction of illegal settlements is a flagrant violation of international law. But are we going to see any action taken on the ground? Is there any hope that this rhetoric will be backed up by actual concrete actions going forward? Well, Mr. Guterres has a chance to actually gain some credibility here and give the UN some uh, credibility or the notion of a backbone by adding Israel to the list of prolific uh, violators of children's rights in armed conflict. Uh, he has been asked to do that, not just by the Palestinian side, but also by human rights organizations, and he has consistently failed to do so uh, um, uh, for political reasons. Um, but I think you know, not to sound, you know, because we're, we're all talking about how things are just not working. Let me give our uh, viewers a little bit of uh, a spark of hope, if you will. There are changing dynamics in the region, in the Arab world, in inter-Arab relations and in arab irani relations. And that is a very positive development because uh, the, the, the window for exploitation of tensions between Iran and the Arab world, particularly the Gulf, um, allowed Israel to, to manipulate uh, uh, the situation, to uh, pretend that the priority for uh, countries in the Gulf was to confront uh, Iran and to forget about the Palestinians and to further, uh, you know, uh, entrench that sense of isolation among Palestinians. Things are uh, moving in a, in a far uh, more positive direction at this point, and I think that is an opportunity the Palestinians must seize. And through that, they must work with willing partners in the international community to uh, uh, make Israel understand that there is a price for its course of conduct. Um, the ending of this situation, which is extreme, uh, violating a people's right to exercise their free will and to be free in their own independent country is extreme, even if no blood is shed. It is uh, um, an aberration. It's something that no people would accept. Now, working with the world to just implement their own legislation about these kinds of violations, about corroborated uh, war crimes that Israel has committed over the years would mean that Israel will understand that it will pay an economic and political price for that. but And that requires a lot of nudging from key Arab players, mm. especially to Europe, which has really, uh, um, you know, ducked mm. its, its responsibility and escaped any notion of real engagement um, that is in line with its professed positions. Uh, it seems that it has mm -hmm. uh, uh, an asterisk uh, that says except for Palestine when it comes mm -hmm. to its positions on international law. And that can change, but it requires mm -hmm. a lot of work on the part of the Arab uh, countries and Palestinians. Uh, Bill, we are starting to run out of time, but I saw you nodding along to some of what Noor was saying there, and it looked like you wanted to jump in, so I'm going to give you the opportunity. Well... <laughs> I just wanted to, to say that uh, Noor is quite correct, that there is a, a shift and it does create a potential opportunities. And should any time, any opportunities arise to, to, to move things forward, then yes, uh, we must look at them. And, and I think the Israelis must look at this too. And the Israelis must be looking for uh, new ways forward. Um, there is still, within this situation, hope for a solution. I put much of that in my uh, belief in the strength of the Palestinian people who are being pushed to violence only because it is the only option left to them. And if there is another option presented, then the violence will recede. The Israelis need to step back enormously from the violence they're using and the rhetoric, the violence of the rhetoric from some of these extremists these fascist ministers, it needs to be reined in. Israel is losing on the world front in the, in the court of public opinion. We see the videos. We saw the young child, two years old, shot dead. We see the daily 
uh, aggressions of the IDF. So Israel needs to take this on board. It's it is being damaged mm. on the world court, and maybe there's opportunity there as well. Yossi, is there anything that you could see right now, uh, a change in policy, uh, a shift in any kind of policy, that would give you any hope about the direction that the Israeli government was taking? And are there any influential figures right now within the government who are able to try to get some momentum going for a different kind of approach? I'm not sure about uh, about your second uh, uh, question. I don't see them. It is really a very rightist uh, government. But I'm, I'm I remember another rightist government, the second rightist government, uh, which uh, was there in 1991, led by Itzhak Shamir, if you remember, and this uh, government eventually went to the Madrid conference which began a, a very, very important process, peace between us and Jordan, the Oslo uh, agreement, and, and uh, so on. So I believe that the, the chance comes uh, from without. It will not come from within the government itself. I believe that when you speak about the UN and what it can do, it is weaker than what we would like to see, but nevertheless, it has the power to put issues on the agenda. And when it sees that such an important issue is off the agenda, the role of the UN, and I talked about it a lot with, with Secretary General Gutierrez, that the role is to just put it on the agenda. We, we are not, we don't, don't expect the UN to be too much involved and to, to change the world. It will be difficult for, for this organization. It is miracle mm -hmm. that, a miracle that it exists at all. But mm -hmm. to put things on the agenda, to put it on the talking points of the mm -hmm. leaderships, when people come to Israel, when people go to, to the Palestinian side, to mm -hmm. raise the, the issues and to suggest ideas. And you know, this conflict is not a unilateral conflict. You have a, a Palestinian side, which is far mm -hmm. from being a saint, if you if you wish. You can understand it or whatever. But mm -hmm. what Hamas is doing in Gaza is not very simple. And it is also a big challenge for the world. Mm -hmm. And the world is not there. We are not interesting for the world. And that is why if the mm -hmm. world doesn't come to us, we should sit together informally and work together as we did in the past mm -hmm. in order to save ourselves in a selfish all, way. All right. We have run out of time, so we're going to have to leave the conversation there. Thanks so much to all of our guests, Yossi Bailin, Nurode, and Bill Law. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. And that's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. For me, Mohammed Jamjoum, and the whole team here, bye for now.